Roman Ayastala, I'm the author of the debugging book, and I'm here to present you a new chapter. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a new installment of automated debugging. Today is the next to last lecture, and I'm, I'm waiting some sort of oh, oh, yeah, from your side now, but I can't hear you, so let's hope everything works fine. Today, uh, we'll be looking at debugging in the large, meaning that we're looking at the process of debugging, how this works from a managerial or from a group perspective with tools that help us organize the debugging process. But before that, I'd like to hand over to Konstantin and Johannes to give news on the current projects and their grading, please. Thank you, Andreas. So good afternoon all. Yeah, we do have some news. We are almost done with the grading of the second project. So we expect to publish all grades either today's evening or uh, on tomorrow's morning. So as usual, you, you will all get the notification via an email with the, the grade. And we also have a small announcement regarding the third project as some of you already noticed, there is a small uh, problem with the project. Instead of the math power function, one should use just Python power function. So we do, uh, we'll do update the project description so that it is aligned with this correction. Yeah, that's it. And well, I hope you all enjoyed the today's lecture. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Konstantin. I'm st I've just encountered a minor technical problem here and I'm still trying to set things up. We'll be running a Redmine instance in order to do some bug tracking and uh, right now it doesn't start up properly of course ah now i know why this is the case <laughs> okay great got it one second so here we go so this is now running up and running up and running up and running timeout expired timeout up to 10 seconds okay let me start this thing again i'm trying to get a, a red mine tracker bug tracker to get up here and running and if everything works well, you should be seeing this in a second from now. If everything works out, that is. So let's just wait another 10 seconds or so till we can get this to them, till we can get this out. Let's see. Okay, one second. Um, See, as life gets more complex, you have to debug. We have to debug more, and we, of course, we have to debug our own. What the fuck happened here? Timeout expired. Of course, these are all things that happened that worked just minutes ago till I rebooted my machine. So let's try this one. Let's try this one. Oh, this was a good command, I love it. Let's do this again. And we're going to again, I'm going to again start this whole thingy. So here we go. Bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. I am the master of this wonderful machine, and I am the master of a beautiful automated red mind script that should be getting all of this up and running within seconds. If, and it has worked like a charm for millions of times, but right now it doesn't. Um, bum, 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 bum. It can only be a matter of seconds till we have everything up and running again. So here we go, it's starting up where it has created a new instance of CQ, CQL, it has created a database and we're getting this Weird error here, which I don't fully understand. One second, what's going on here? Okay, let me just do this manually. Oops. Ah, oh, here we go. 
Oh, wonderful. And we are doing this wonderful command here. And it should be running. Ah, I know what the problem is. It sort of takes more time than expected. Okay, now it's running, I hope. Yes, it's running. It is running and it has run. Now oh, that's good. I have a timeout here, which is the problem. Okay, and then now I can actually go through this entire big thingy here. <laughs> You'd be amazed if you look at the if you look at the current chapter. Current chapter, if you look at it in HTML, is nothing but um, it's nothing but screenshots, one screenshot after another. But in fact, the notebook that runs in the background actually creates all these screenshots by running an internal, by running uh, a bug tracker with the, via web via a web browser, and actually um, running all of this in the background and to remote controlling this bug tracker. So uh, it can only be a matter of time till we have everything up and running. Okay, we have the screenshots, that's fine too. And we have added a couple of bug reports, that's fine too. And we have answered the quizzes, which is hopefully, which of course is fine too. Actually, we should set this up such that quizzes, such that quizzes come with hints or something. So only a matter of, minutes until we have everything in here. So that works too. And that works too. How great is that? Wonderful. Okay, now the magic comes. Let's see whether we can connect to our server. Yes, we can. And we can also, and I can also log in, I think. Here we go, and I am logged in. Okay, if only this would work. Ah, here we go, cool. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, things are ready and I am ready to rumble. If it weren't for, if it weren't for the occasional skipping of things. So let me just move this somewhere down here. And we can go and start our, start our presentation. Let me just enlarge this a bit such that you can actually see things. Okay, cool. Okay, good. Let me share my screen <clears throat> and we can start right away. I'm sorry for the, sorry for the delay. So, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, today is the day when we will be moving into debugging in the large. That is how to actually organize the process of fixing bugs not in our own little cycle when we are all alone as developers and getting something to run, but actually in a large cycle when bugs are being reported by other users, other developers, generally other people, which means that um, these others, these third parties have to communicate what the bug is about to us, the developers who actually eventually have to fix it. And we have to make sure that these bugs do not get lost. To this end, uh, what we are to this end, what we are using is so-called bug trackers to organize the debugging process. And today, I'm going to briefly demo you one of these bug trackers and give you hints on how they work. Without further ado, let us go straight away into one of these bug trackers. So I have already set up a. I already have set up. The Redmine bug tracker, which we're also also going to explore later within the chapter. And let me just share my screen here, such that you do have a chance to actually see what's going on, which we do right now. Oh yeah, okay. You should be able to see the Redmine tracker right now. There should be a big title on top, the debugging book. Konstantin Johannes, can you confirm? Yep. Yes, works. Wonderful always amazed at the marvels of technology here. Okay, what I have here is the user interface for Redmine, which is generally spoken an issue tracker. What is an issue tracker? An issue tracker is a tool where you, well, which is a tool around a database of issues where people, including third parties, including you, can enter issue reports and where 
developers can then take these issue reports and, find, and work on them, marking their current status on how they are. I already have entered a couple of um, I already have entered a couple of issue reports in here. This is the view that I get as a developer. When I start my work in the morning, first thing I do is uh, I get a cup of coffee. Now, second thing I do is I open the issue I open the issue tracker and I find out what's on my list of things to be done for today. So here I've set up a project a project aptly named the debugging book. And I can now look into that, and I find that there's a couple of um, that there's a couple of uh, issues already in here. You see, there's a couple of bugs. There's two bugs in here which I have to work on. There's also a couple of features. All these features are listed as open, and there's none closed. The aim of my work as a developer is to get all these bugs and features from open <clears throat> to closed. In a way, a developer is a machine that transforms open bugs into closed bugs and open features into closed features. At least that's from the perspective of an issue tracker, this is what you're doing. So what you can do now is, as a developer again, you can find out which bugs are there actually in here. So you click on one of these bugs and here's one, uh, what is that? Does not render correctly on Nokia communicator. We can click on that and then we can find out details about this one. This one was filed five minutes ago. And here you learn what's going, what should be done. And you find a bug report that tells you that the debugging book does not render correctly on the Nokia Communicator 9000. Um, Andreas, yes, sorry. either it's me or your screen sharing is frozen because I still see the main page. Yeah, the same for me. Oh, you still see the main page. Very interesting. Yeah. Which main page? So the debugging book where bugs, features, support. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. Let me just stop sharing and we'll, and we're going to restart one second. The wonderful techniques that we're having here. So let me try sharing again. Here we go. So do you now see something that says Nokia communicator up here? No, I see Andreas Zella has started sharing uh, screen sharing. Uh, Just nothing the black else. screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let me do this differently then, just for the fun of it. Share screen. And let's try this one. So, how is that now? It's still a black screen. So, still nothing more than Andreas Zella has started screen sharing. Oh, that's very nice. Okay, let me try something else here. But you've seen the introduction, right? So yes. Okay, very interesting. Okay, we'll simply go for another mode here and things will be just fine. Good, so let me just go back. Okay, <laughs> modern technology, I tell you. So Safari issues, the debugging book. So how about now? Still the same. Do you see me scrolling up and down here? No, I, I, I just see a black screen. It just says that you started sharing your screen and that I can double click to enter full screen mode, but that's it. Okay, cool. But you don't see anything, okay? I don't see anything. Oh. Pause share. Ah, now, now I see something. <laughs> Okay, so now you see something, is that good? Yes, so now I see an issue. Okay. Are you good. moving your cursor? I am moving my cursor, here's my cursor. Can you see my cursor? No, you can't see no, the I see the cursor, but it doesn't move. Yeah, it looks like it's frozen. So now it changed. Yeah, now it's moving. Now it appears to be working. Okay, so what was, it? was that the last view you also had? Is that right? No, I was on the overview page on the overview page, which should yeah. look like this one. Yeah, this one, yeah. Okay, so we we'll resume from here on, okay? <laughs> Good. So <clears throat> what you see here is, what you see here is bugs and features. All of these are issues, depending on whether they fix a bug or whether they should add a new feature. And these are open or closed. And your job as developers is to turn all these open issues into closed issues. 
from, from the viewpoint of a bug tracker, of an issue tracker, this is your main goal. And now we go into one of these bugs. Let us find out some of the open bugs in here. And what you see here is a bug that says, does not render correctly on Nokia communicator. And I'm curious to see what this one is. It was entered nine minutes ago. And it tells us that the debugging book does not render correctly on the Nokia communicator 9000. Does anyone know in here what a Nokia communicator 9000 is? We can find that out by ourselves. Nokia communicator 9000, does it actually exist? Very good question. Images, images. Yes. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a Nokia Communicator 9000, and it's actually not a big surprise that it doesn't render correctly here. But well, we are great. Um, we are we are we are uh, great programmers. So let's find out what we can do to actually fix that. This bug report has has a couple of important features. It tells us the context in which a bug occurs, which is this Nokia communicator thingy. It doesn't exactly tell us uh, which version of the debugging book that is, but that's not too surprising because we don't have a versioning number for the debugging book, at least not yet. The important thing is it tells us um, the steps to reproduce. As you will find out in the chapter, these steps to reproduce a bug are the most important ingredient in a bug report because they tell the developer exactly what to do. So first we go to the debugging book page. I actually don't think that the Nokia communicators are even going to support HTTPS, but that's another thingy. And then you go for a particular, then you go for a particular page and then you scroll down to the page. And last step, which is also important, it tells you what the expectations are. So what the expectations were, what did I want to see here and what did I see instead? So what is, how does reality differ from my expectations? And um, this is the bug which I am now supposed to fix. Such a bug report uh, is actually, uh, or writing an effective bug report is actually an exercise in itself. You have to come up with a good, uh, with a good and short uh, summary such that um, anyone who reads that will immediately know whether this is a bug which may have been fixed or which already, which still is in the open. What's also important is to list the steps to reproduce. And um, this is a pro tip. It's a good idea to be as factual and short as possible. In particular, a bug report is not a good place to vent off on how good or bad a product actually is or how lazy or incompetent developers are. Actually, any kind of sarcasm in a bug report uh, is not going to increase the chances of uh, the bug report getting of the bug report getting addressed. So these are all these are all steps to reproduce, and I can now go as a developer and go and fix this one. What I can also do is I can also go and uh, assign this bug report to someone else. So I can go here on bug, and I can say okay. Maybe I'm a manager, actually I'm a manager, and I can go and I want to assign this bug report to someone else. So I can go and assign this to, oops, um, ah, there's not many people. I can only assign this to myself. Let me just try to assign this to myself, which interestingly enough is actually a bit, bit difficult to, to obtain here. So I'm moving my cursor up here and then, no, and then I'm moving up, no, 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 no. doesn't work at this resolution. Oh, this is really amazing. So let's do it this way. So I'm going to assign this to myself just to be clear that I am actually now working on this. So managers or anyone who has the capability to do so can assign tasks to individuals. And um, then it's actually clear who's supposed to work on that. So let me assume that I am actually the Redmine admin in here and I actually have managed to, uh, that I've managed to fix all that. How do I, <clears throat> how do, I do that? Well, the way I work on the, the way I, the way I say that this has been fixed is I go into, uh, go and edit this book and I change the status here from new, which means it has just, it has just been reported into, uh, <clears throat> into a new status, which is called resolved. And resolved means I'm done, that's it. And um, in order to, and, um, in order to um, 
Now, to see, in order to tell how I actually how I actually resolve this, I can now go and do a couple, put a couple of nodes in here. I can say that I can say that I actually um, that I actually um, make this work only under specific circumstances or only in an emulation of uh, only an emulation of the Nokia communicator or likewise. Then I press on submit and then it's actually updated in here. Even more important, I can give the bug a resolution. So if you go in here, let me just reload this page such that the status is now the status is now adequately shown here as resolved. I can go and um, assign the bug a, I can go and assign the bug a resolution. And this resolution, which I currently cannot find, where is the resolution in here, uh, is going to tell uh, how, is going to tell what the, what the bug is about. For instance, I can give it, a, I can also give it a status of rejected, for in, which means in here that I don't want to work on this or I cannot work on this because for instance, I have no idea, uh, I have no plan to actually make the, um, I have no plan to make the bug work uh, to make this, um, sorry, I have no intention to make the debugging work, book work on a Nokia communicator. So I go and reject this whole thing. So with all of these individual, with all of these individual changes to the status, I can always at any point go and find out what the current status of all my projects are. So right now I can, for instance, find out which bugs are actually open. Um, and I find that there's only one bug left at this point, but I can also go and check for all features in here. That is, so let me just apply this thing in here. Then I will also find features in here. Um, Interestingly enough, I can not only use this to I can not only use this to handle all bugs, one bug after the other, but I can also use this to organize the actual development of my product, because I can just as well assign features into that, which is a shortcut for I do have a I do have an issue here, namely there's a feature missing, and the first feature I may be able to enter in here is the product is not there yet, or the product is entirely missing, then I can divide this, and then I can go and divide this, uh, and then I can divide this task into multiple sub features. I want feature A, feature B, feature C, and then I'm assigning this to individual developers. And while developers are working, they can also say, um, I'm 50% I'm done, I'm 60% done, I'm 80% done. So not only is this useful for making sure that no issue ever gets lost, but it's also useful for uh, checking what the current status is of my current project and actually steering the entire development of a project from the very first beginning, the very first features as they, as, as they are being developed to the very end uh, when it's in maintenance and when one bug after the, after the other is being fixed. Um, this actually, <clears throat> this actually, Go, this actually is even more organized than what we've seen already. So let me just switch my switch my screen over here, and I'm going to show you the actual. And I'm going to show you a bit of the actual life cycle a project goes through. So let me just make sure that we actually see this thingy here. Wonderful. And here we go. That's how it works. So. <clears throat> Let me share my screen again, such that we can see things. So desktop three, and here we go. Okay. So um, simple question, Johannes, are you able to see my screen at this point? You should yes, see I see. You should a be graph able to with see. new assigned and resolved. You should be able to see a wonderful graphic in here. Yes, that's what we have. And um, what we have seen right now in our demo is a very simple is a very simple workflow. A, as a developer, you get a bug report, an issue report, and in the beginning it's new. Then it's being assigned to an individual, and in the end it's finally resolved. And a typical way to resolve this is that you give it a resolution 
that is either fixed, which is the ideal one. Um, the bug has been fixed and it's going to go into production soon. But there's also invalid, meaning that the um, issue report misses some information. There's also duplicate, which is a problem in itself. If you do have a, if you do have a um, system that has many, many users, you will get the same bug report, a very similar bug report, some very many users. And your job is actually to find out that uh, despite you having dozens of bug reports about one issue, that there's only one fix. So you need to tie all these together such that you don't have a dozen developers working on the same thing. There is also won't fix. Won't fix means, this is the similar as what we just had in Redmine. Won't fix is that you do not plan to fix this because um, there is simply, this is not going to become a feature anytime soon. And then there is a bit of a sad resolution in here too, which is works for me. Works for me essentially means I was not able to reproduce the bug. I, uh, despite my best efforts, reading your bug report, trying to reproduce the steps, reading the code, figuring out why things could happen, I wasn't able to reproduce the bug. Okay, that is a very simple, uh, there's a very simple uh, process in three states. But um, in real life, things are a bit more complicated than that. Because if I, as a developer, go and fix things, I typically do not just go and, um, and commit this and then it goes into production. No, my, whatever I'm doing has to be reviewed and maybe even tested and make sure it doesn't break other things. That's the job of quality assurance and quality assurance also has a say into that. Also, I may get overwhelmed with bug reports, so I may want to reassign a couple of my of the issues I'm working on to someone else. Or it can also be that an issue report comes on in in the first place, and <clears throat> then uh, the issue is uh, uh, named invalid or duplicate from the very beginning on. And with that, we get a bit more complex uh, state model in here. So when a bug comes in, it's not simply made, it's not immediately marked as new. It's first marked as unconfirmed, meaning somebody has to go over it, do some triaging, and then find out whether it's new or not. And only if it's new, then we actually start things. If it's an invalid bug or a duplicate bug, then we go immediately to the status of closed, and then we're done. If a bug is assigned as new, here we go, then it is, stays new until it's assigned to a developer, then it becomes assigned, but it can also become unassigned again, and then it becomes a new bug again. And after assigned, and after I, as a developer now have fixed the bug, then it goes to resolved, then quality assurance can check it. And if it's not, if they're not satisfied, then it goes into reopened, and then it has to be assigned to another developer, here we go. Uh, and only if the quality assurance is confirmed that this is a good fix, then it's closed. But even so, if a bug is closed, it may well be that the bug is reopened because it occurs again, because my fix has been incomplete or because I've overseen something. So the same bug is reopened again with new information. And if it's reopened again, then it has to become assigned and everything else. So you see that what we actually saw as a model of a bug going through three states actually is more complex than that. And there are plenty of transitions in this bug life cycle that we have in here. And as you can see, the life cycle of a bug actually really is a cycle because even if a bug is closed, it may always be resurrected. And so the life of a bug technically never ends. If you, if you wonder how, um, if you wonder how many, what a real bug database looks like. So we only have seen six bugs with um, hypothetical, hypothetical bugs in here. Uh, if you want to know what a real bug database looks like, let me just guide you to the, uh, let me just guide you to the, uh, to a real bug database with plenty of bugs in here. Let me just share my screen again. And here we go. This is the, oh, where is it? Okay, here we go. And again, Johannes, do you see my, do you see, do you see the wonderful Bugzilla, Mozilla yes. database? That's, yes, I do. Let me make this slightly bigger so that you can see things. 
Um, this is the bug database of Firefox, which is the well-known uh, well web browser. Bugzilla has been around for Firefox and other Mozilla projects for a bit more than 20 years at this point. So it's so for 20 years it has been collecting bug, it has been collecting bug reports. And the one the one thing that is absolutely striking is what you see up here. This is the uh, this is the bug ID that you're seeing. As you can see, this has more than 1.5 million bug reports. 1.5 million. And uh, this is homework for you. Find out how many of these are actually in a state that is not resolved. That is, it is how many of these bug reports actually are listed as open, which is amazing. So we can actually look into one of these real bug reports. So let me just take the first one here. There's an access, accessibility issue. Oh, this is the first one I'm getting and it was opened two years ago. So this is still something that should be done. And here's a user who says that uh, we should have something, we should, we should have something that has better support, uh, that has better support for screen readers. See, if you have one and a half million, if you have uh, millions of users, there's one user for every, well, there's one user for every feature under the sun. And this is a user who says, if you are, if, if you are blind, you have, you may have specific troubles using specific features and please go and make that better and, and fix this. And you can see this is a bug which has a status of unconfirmed. So it's in here and it's waiting for somebody from the, from the Mozilla team to actually look into that. So here's another one, what is that? ESR language change problem, minimized Firefox window blocks auto hide, auto -hide window taskbar, and so on and so on and so on. This is 500, this is just the first 500 we were randomly getting when we were looking into, when we were looking into the bug database of Firefox. And yes, you can look into all these and yes, and if you find a bug with Firefox yourself, you can also enter your own bug. You can also enter your own bug in here. So such a, such a uh, issue database is absolutely crucial for organizing your software project. Because if you don't have one, what else do you have? Well, if you don't have one, you don't know what bugs you actually have. You, if you don't have one, you don't know who's working on a bug. If you don't have one, you don't know how close you are to completion. Everybody is in the dark. So I don't know what a developer does then. A developer in the morning starts working, opens the source code and finds, oh, here's an interesting feature. I may possibly work on that one. That's all nice, but you see somebody has to, but somebody has to decide which features and which bugs actually have to be working on. This is also where, a, where it's helpful to have a priority for individual bugs, which is also what you do as a manager. You decide which bugs get fixed first and which one get fixed later. Priorities can go from uh, the lowest priority goes to enhancements, which is an improvement in the product or some function. And then it goes over minor and major over to showstopper. Showstopper is the hardest, the worst category of bugs, which means that development comes to a halt. This happens if you uh, have a bug, which for instance, no longer allows that somebody builds uh, the product. So you break the build. And I can tell you that if you work in a real big software company and you go and commit changes that uh, actually break the build that are that make it impossible for others to work and test on your software, um, you do this exactly twice. You do this once and then you get a then you get the equivalent of a spanking or standing in the corner for one hour. So you, get, so, you get, so you get lots of blame. The second time you do this, you don't. Which means that, uh, which means that um, whatever you do when you fix a bug, be sure that you can still very well create, that you can still very well build your entire system. Okay, and that's already all there is. You can toy with Redmine yourself, that, which would mean that you can go and install it. You can also toy with real world databases such as Bugzilla. Just don't change anything unless you really, unless you are a bug, unless you are a bug reporter or a Mozilla developer. 
Um, we actually do have somebody on our panel today with first-hand experience from Mozilla. Johannes, have you ever worked with the Mozilla database? Uh, yes, I did. So, can you tell us a bit about? Can you tell us a bit? Can you can you tell us a bit about what I told was correct or how it's actually being used at Mozilla, or is there just a big dump that everybody ignores? <laughs> Depends, I guess. Um... And so no, it actually Mozilla uses uh, uses Bugzilla um, very frequently and um, heavily relies on the bugs in there and the bug reports in there. And um, so basically, what happens at Mozilla is for, in their build system for every single build failure, there is automatically a new bug report filed and input into Bugzilla for someone to check. Um, where this was coming from and whether it makes made sense that this well, whether it's actually a bug or whatever it is whether it was a an intermittent failure so meaning an issue in the build system um, some resource not loaded uh, stuff like this so they they use it very frequently um, and it is an integral part of their software development process mm -hmm. um, however for some issues I mean we also filed some bugs there uh, yeah, half a year later, you might get a response, if any. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I depends, but it's it's very important. Um, it it wouldn't work without Boxilla for them or some similar tool. <laughs> I can confirm this from my experiences with uh, other software companies. I'm not going to I'm not going to name them right now. Uh, actually, um, actually, I, I, I think I was the very first non-Microsoft person to ever have a peek into the bug databases of Microsoft. Um, you may have, so are you seeing something, Fox? Just checking? Yes, yes. Okay, you're seeing this wonderful bug reporting tool here. This is a GNOME one, not the Windows one. If you're working on Windows, but also on, but or maybe also on Linux, certainly on a Mac, if you have a program that fails, okay, you will, you will have seen these dialogues popping up. Uh, these dialogues where then data is automatically collected. The data that is being automatically collected typically is a stack trace. That is the functions that were active at the moment the crash happened and some configuration information. Not more than that because anything, say the data that you've been working on could be very interesting for debugging, but unfortunately um, users, but unfortunately would be it would be very um, it would be very delicate if users were sharing the data that they're working on. I mean, sure, my browser crashes every time I go to Pornhub and click specific categories. That's not somebody I want to know. And as a developer, actually, I don't want to know this either. So, but but this information is not contained in stack traces. In stack traces, it simply says I was open the, that the browser was opening a particular a particular element of type X, and that's something I may be able to look into. And um, these and these automatic crashes. Um, these automatic crashes that are being sent out to developers contain stack traces, they contain configuration, and they also contain this extra information telling us what were you doing when the application crashed, which is where users can then add additional information, such as the steps to reproduce. A, I was, uh, I, I was doing this, then I was doing that, and then I was doing that, and then the whole thing disconnected and it crashed. All of this is super helpful. If you are a big uh, software company that manufactures, say, operating systems for PCs, and if you have set up your operating system such that every time any application on your system, uh, such, such, such that whenever any user in the world has an application that crashes and this is automatically sent back to you, you will get very many, very, very many of such crash reports, even if there's just one, if, even if there's just one crash per week per user, uh, you simply have so many users that your database will be absolutely flooded. And um, units like, uh, say, uh, bug reports per second are totally are, are not the correct units to describe the flow, the the the, the flood of crash reports that you get. 
And yes, all the all, all the time, all the time there's all, all the time there is some third party application crashing somewhere. Of course, it's never your own, it's never your own product. Did anyone ever have had did anyone ever have a have a true genuine Microsoft? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Uh, a, a US vendor uh, product crashing on them? No, uh, nobody ever. Okay, good. So also a, bit, also a bit of information. You can get plenty of data this way. And since we're talking about data that we are getting through bug reports, let me get you to the second chapter for today. So we have seen how to collect bug data in databases which is an essential prerequisite for organizing the debugging process. And of course, as good developers, you know that a version database is absolutely crucial for organizing your daily work such that no change gets lost. Which means that you do have information about changes in your database, you have information about bugs in your database, you may have even more such as um, such as uh, interactions between developers as they talk about how to fix specific bugs, interactions with users and everything. And uh, at some point, the question arises, can you go and um, actually mine such information from your databases in order to, in order to get some insights? And uh, for this last chapter of the book, I have prepared something for you. And this is a kept this is a this is a mechanism that allows you to count the changes in a particular uh, git repository and visualize these and since this takes a few minutes to execute you already have started it this is what such a visualization looks like so this is actually the debugging book project in here and what you see here is a tree map representation and this tree map representation consists of nested uh, rectangles, where each rectangle stands for a directory, and the filled rectangles stand for, the filled rectangles stand for files. So what we have here is the debugging book repository. So that's not too exciting. And in here we have a folder or directory called notebooks. And in this notebooks folder, you do have a couple of well, <laughs> not very surprising notebooks. These are the chapters of the book. What we have here is, uh, is the chapter on assertions. We have the chapter on dynamic invariants. We have the chapter on interactive debuggers and likewise. Actually, all of these are organized by size. So the largest one seems to be the slicer in here. And one of the smaller ones is huh, the class diagram part, the release notes, all these are not very big. And the color of these rectangles indicates the number of changes they have been going through. So here, for instance, we have uh, the chapter on slicing. This is a very big step. This is a very big and complex chapter. This has seen no less than 110 commits until it was ready. That's what, that, that's what, that's what I'm working on, doing one commit after the other, adding feature after feature and fixing bug after bug. The chapter on automatic repair, which you also have seen, also is one of the also is one of the most uh, is also one of the most um, say frequently changed ones. And there's also this others such as change counter, which is this very chapter. This has only seen four comments so far, uh, simply because well, it's all new and there has had haven't been that many that many changes to it. By and how does this work? Um, this works actually by running. And this actually works by running a flurry of git commands on the git database, which extract the entire change history for each and every component. So for every slicer dot, yeah, for every, including all the files, including all the, including all the notebooks. And then it simply counts how many changes were made to a particular, to a, to a particular chapter. Um, <clears throat> The details on this are, of course, in the book. But what you also can do is, and that's actually just four lines of code, you can also go and say, OK, I'm not only interested in changes, I'm interested in fixes. Because changes, 
you know, one change, another change, another change, it depends. Some people try to, some people tend to block all their changes in one single chunk. Others do micro changes for every single little feature they add, they make another commit. But fixes are interesting because fixes give you an idea on how many bugs there are in a component. Because obviously the more bugs they have been in a component, the more frequently these were fixed. So here I have another visualization, which also gives us uh, the individual notebooks, but now it's actually telling us how many fixes were made. And for the debugging book, this is actually pretty simple because um, if in the debugging book, this is my own discipline, if a commit message to the version database starts with the word fix, then it is a fix. Other better techniques may be to actually look for bug numbers and to see whether a commit contains a bug number that is actually also an entry in the bug database. This is far more sophisticated. Here we go for something that is very project specific. And uh, we can actually look this up and here's the, and this actually shows not only the, not only the, not the number of fixes, but actually lists the individual fixes. What have we had here? Adjust line numbers for external functions didn't work properly. Spurious data dependencies, better call allocations, handle case when all is untracked, missing cells, support for generators, string and num wouldn't work when imported. Boom. Yep, all of these were individual bugs that had to be fixed at some point. And this is how we can look them up, whatever happened here. This is actually the darkest slicer because this is the most complex one. I guess this should be repair. No, it's statistical debugger. So statistical debugger has seen the second most bugs in the, in the project. So uh, when importing line numbers were off by one, I am sure that this is something that Konstantin has found and Konstantin has fixed and I also fixed it then in the statistical debugging. Fix bad you, fix debugger only worked in notebook. You cannot use it in Python code outside of the notebook. Code with coverage was failing. Oh, fix missing comma. Oh, I missed a comma. Is that a missing comma in the text or is it a missing comma in the code? Well, in, <clears throat> well, uh, up for us to actually analyze all this. And this is how we can go and um, this is how we can go and find out not only um, which parts were changed, but we can also find out which change, which parts were fixed most often. Now you can think, um, what does it mean if a component was fixed frequently? Does that mean that all bugs are fixed now? Or does that mean that there are more bugs? Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the sad reality is that if a component was fixed frequently in the past, chances are that it's going to be fixed frequently in the future too. It's like fishing. You go to a spot where you find plenty of fish and lo and behold, there's plenty of fish to, fish to catch. And the next morning you come back to the same spot, it turns out that the fishes still like to go there and so you can find more fishes there. Except that for fishes, we do have a good theory on how they reproduce. We don't have such a similar, we don't have such a theory for bugs. But the important thing to remember is that bugs and the, and the number of bugs that you find is very much dependent on the environment. So there are tasks in your environment or which simply have a big complexity inherently from the very beginning. Slicing is complex. Whereas for instance, what do we have here? Writing an appendix is not very complex, okay? Or what do we have here an index? Time travel debugger, huh? It was simple. They were just reducing code. Invariants, invariants were not, invariants apparently were not very complicated either, okay? But building a slicer is inherently complex. So simply by writing lots of code on, in a, in a, for complex requirements, you will have many bugs. And then there's also requirements which change frequently. Um, <laughs> again, um, while I was working, while I was working with big software companies, there were components which were which which were essentially changing every single week or so, simply because um, simply because the requirements had changed again, or the requirements were unstable. 
And even if you, from your side, think that the requirements are stable, this does not necessarily hold for, your, for, for the other folks whom you work with. Um, it may even be that you have to work around the bugs that they create, which means that you're going to have even more fixes in your part of the code. If you consider, say again, large operating systems, for instance, you will find that there's hotspots which get fixed all over the place again and again, partly because they are super complex, but also partly because the requirements and the associated hardware change all the time. We have done similar mappings like these for uh, Firefox. And for Firefox, this is some time ago, we tracked which uh, components in the code had the most security issues. And it turned out that, of course, JavaScript was the one component with the, by far most security issues because, well, JavaScript is complex. We have just-in-time compiling, which is very, very nasty to debug, very, very nasty to properly test. So no wonder these were, this were, these were the parts where we had the most security issues. But there were other parts which also were listed in orange in a map like this. And these were also parts which maybe were not so much on the radar, also not so much on the radar of managers, and who would always be very, very happy when we would point them to uh, components that actually also had seen quite a number of bugs in the past. Actually, this uh, module is pretty generic. Um, all you can, you can actually run this on any Git repository. Um, if you run this on a project which is larger than the, than, than the debugging book, you're going to see, oh, you will have to wait for several minutes until you get a nice tree map out of this. But run this on a project of your own and find out where the most changes are. And if you can easily identify fixes from changes, then you can also find out where the most fixes are. As an added bonus, we're having an extra part in here because so far we only talked about those files that were most bug prone. Um, but what you also can do is you can break down the files into individual elements. That is, for instance, individual classes and functions and methods. So individual parts that are named in your code. And <clears throat> this is something we have done here. And then again, we have broken down the changes into individual parts. So what you see here, let's take a look again at the slicer class in here. Let's see which parts were most frequently changed. And you can see that in the slicer, in the slicer notebook, the slicer class has seen the most changes, namely seven, dependency tracker with four, dependencies with two, tint, t-int. This is not even there anymore in the current slicer version, but it had also seen one change. And we have the middle function, which has seen two changes, and access transformer, which has seen one change. So uh, you can also go and uh, go for individual parts in here. So here we have reducing code. Dynamic invariance is really, really large. So you can see that, oops, sorry, I think we went one too far in here. So you can see that um, there's also been quite a number of changes that have been distributed all across, all across, the, um, all across the module or all across the chapter that is. You can also go and look for individual parts in repair. So this again gives you a view on how to look at and how to look at individual, on how to look at uh, individual components that are even more fine grained than uh, that are even more fine grained than what you that what you find if you're looking at only large files. Um, this is also something. So the breakdown of um, of modules into individual parts comes with a couple of regular expressions that work well for Jupyter Notebooks, for um, Python, for uh, C programs, and actually anything that looks like a C program. So as long as, it is, as, as long as people use curly braces, there is a good chance of it being able to, um, to break things down into smaller parts. And there again, you can adapt this to your own code and find out where the most changes and possibly even where the most fixes were made. And the whole thing comes as an SVG, so you can actually send this out. You can even send this, this is part of HTML. You can even send this out in an email, send this out to your manager and tell your manager, hey, this is where the most changes are. Um, with that, a small word of caution. So all this data 
can also give uh, rise to misinterpretations. In particular, if you go and bring individual developers into play. So what you also can find out for all of these for all, all of these changes and fixes is which developer actually has worked on them. And you may be tempted to you may be tempted to find out which developers have made the most fixes and possibly therefore have made the most bugs. You can also come up with metrics that tell you how many lines of code were changed per individual developers. And then you can come up with ranked lists of, um, with ranked lists of developers by their so-called productivity or, or inverse ranking by the, how many bugs they made, okay? Or, how, or even how bug prone their components are and make this a metric. Okay, I would extremely advise, um, advise against doing such investigations. First, if you go and measure the performance of people by these metrics, people are going to behave in a way that they will fulfill these metrics. That is, um, if I am being judged by the number of bugs I fix, I will, fix, I, I will go and fix zillions of bugs. Very simple, pay me $1 per bugs I fix and next morning I'll come up with 10,000 bugs which are found and fixed. If only, if only, if only the, the tiniest one. The color was red, but it should be blue. Oh, and then the blue color was blue, but it should be red. Oh, and then it should be blue again. I can change it. I can change things back and forth and fill up the database with plenty of whatever requests, okay? So none of this makes sense. The second thing is, and that's uh, more important, um, <laughs> Um, these numbers, what, what you find, can also be very misleading. Um, I, well, I, my student Tom Zimmerman and myself, we were among the very first to mine such change and bug databases. And um, at the time, we were looking, among others, into the bug database of um, into the bug database of Eclipse. You know, Eclipse, the big uh, programming environment for Java and other languages. And uh, we took a look into who made the most changes that later had to be fixed. So who wrote the most code which later had to be fixed again? Or to put it very close, very shortly, who wrote the most buggy code? Well. It turned out that the person who wrote the most buggy code was no one else but Erich Gamma himself. Erich Gamma, the creator of Eclipse. Erich Gamma, the inventor of design patterns or co-inventor. Erich Gamma, the co-inventor of unit testing. Yes, the, a, a living legend, see? He was the one who wrote the buggiest code in Eclipse. So we had lots of fun when we found that out. Oh, the big Erich Gamma writes code which has to be fixed again and again. Well, <laughs> we talked to him. <laughs> we talked to him and this is what he told us. Um, he told us that, um, see, there's the Eclipse team and there's a hierarchy in there. Erich is at the top and there, there, there are his minions and there's more minions and sub minions and everything, okay? And here comes somebody, here's somebody who works on a bug database at some point in the morning, somebody down in the hierarchy and finds, here's a bug, oh, this is a super complex thing. I cannot touch this and I'm not going to touch this. I am going to reassign this bug to my boss because my boss is, has more expertise than I am. And then this boss finds out, oh, this is super complex. I don't want to touch this code. I'm going to give this to my boss. And then this goes up the, this goes up the hierarchy until it ends up with the single person who has no boss anymore that uh, this could actually be, that this bug could be reassigned to. And this person who is at the very top happens to be Erich Gamma. And no, he cannot go and assign this to someone else. Somebody has to work on this super complex and super risky and super brutal thing. And it should be the person with the most experience overall and somebody who actually knows it all. And this is Erich. And still the risk of breaking things is far too high. And this is 
why all the complex bugs end up with Erich Gamma and all the simple bugs were already all fixed at the lower levels. Same goes if you're working, same, this, is, this is the same thing in industry. The more competent you are, the more difficult or the higher you rise in the hierarchy, the more difficult the decisions you have to work on because the simple decisions are already all being, being taken care of. So, and before you go and find out that your boss is actually the one who makes the most mistakes, also keep in mind that your boss may actually be the one who actually is the one who risks, who actually, who actually dares going into all these parts because um, such, uh, such complicated assignments may not end up with you at all. Okay. So far, so this was a bit about um, this was a bit about um, mining such bug and change databases. So whereas uh, the chapter on bug databases has no code to execute or to work with, uh, the chapter on um, mining databases has plenty of opportunities to work with, to toy with, and I would very much encourage you to try this out yourself on your own database. And if you like what you're seeing. There's a whole world of research and also uh, quite, uh, quite some world now of uh, commercial tools that allow you to explore such back databases, to visualize them. And yes, there is quite a lot to learn about individual projects. Thank you very much and enjoy. And I'm happy to take questions. So Johannes, Konstantin, uh, any questions from your side? Anything in the chat? Anything in the question and answer window? Um, no, not really. No questions. Are you all happy? Yes. So far, nothing in the Q&A window. Okay. Well, actually, I have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> so when we have a long list of issues mm -hmm. or even a long list of fixes afterwards, mm -hmm. so how to understand which ones are important and which ones are minor? Because even uh, from what you have shown us, yeah, some fixes are just a comma, mm -hmm. but others are about critical parts of the system. So yes. any comment on the prioritization <laughs> of things? Yes. So, um, so if you only have the change history, there's, there's typically not going to be too much meta information about why you made that change or about why you made that change or which issue this is actually related to. This is why good uh, development practices mandate that if you do a commit, you should put in a bug number into your commit message, which then relates to the appropriate issue in the bug database. And this is where you can then find additional meta information such as the description of the bug and how serious it is, whether this was a major bug, a minor bug, an enhancement or likewise, okay? So this gives you then extra information and uh, you would typically be well advised not to, well, to, for instance, to make a strong distinction between bugs and features because um, if a feature was added in a particular place, what does this tell you about this particular place? Not much, but if a, but if a bug was fixed, in particular, if a bug was fixed after the um, project went into production, that's of course a far more important issue and that's something you may want to minimize over time. Having said that, um, not all the information you find in real bug databases it can be totally can be totally uh, relied upon because for instance when i say you need to differentiate between bugs and features um, we have done a study uh, this is uh, several years ago i think seven years ago we did that uh, we have made a study uh, by uh, kim hatzik my phd student um, he has gone through thousands and thousands of bug reports and manually classified them and found out that many bug reports that are listed as bugs were actually features and vice versa, which means that, um, and, and that's one thing. And second thing is, uh, depending on the discipline in your project, not every commit message may have the appropriate bug numbers in there. It uh, always depends on, it always depends on, uh, on the discipline of your coworkers and how much your coworkers 
see or have the insight that later on an analysis of this data is going to point out how to improve how to improve the development process but if you give tools like these like the stream map to developers and make them find out who oh, these are this is where the bugs are that's very interesting uh, if, if you if you create tools like these and, and then show developers how much of their discipline in writing a commit message is required to make these things work um, then um, you get more then then you get a high uh, somewhat higher rigor in your data collection and then you have you also have better ways to actually uh, to actually make all of this data sing having said that um, you're always advised to do a manual inspection of the data before by figuring out how you, how reliable it is before you go and uh, before you go and uh, uh, create an analysis out of it and in particular before and in particular you should very much do that before you take you draw any consequences out of it yeah thank you thank you for does it answer your question okay yes good Okay, Johannes, anything to add from your side? No. <laughs> Any best practices for commit messages for bug databases? Something that bugs you all the time? There, there are lots of things, especially if, if um, you don't describe the bug well or just say it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. Okay, but what was... Um, the circumstances under which it didn't work mm -hmm. um, and if you if you cannot replicate it or if you don't even know what the environment was and how to replicate it it's it's super hard to mm -hmm. to even figure out what could be wrong um, yep so this is something i hate to see so this doesn't work okay yep Believe it or not, I once got a bug report. This was for GNU DDD, which is also a debugger for that matter. Um, I got a bug report that simply says, um, your debugger crashes, period. Yep. These three words were the entirety of the bug report. I <laughs> said, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm going to fix this immediately because here I am having my whatever uh, 50,000 lines of C++ code and somewhere in there it crashes. And of course, I mean, I'm a genius. I can immediately see when it crashes and why it crashed and everything. And yeah, sure, that's how it works. Yeah. Yeah, but sometimes it's actually not that easy to create this bug report without revealing some sensitive data, right? Yeah. As I said before, if my browser crashes on Pornhub and only on Pornhub, it's <laughs> it's not definitely it's not definitely something I'd like to tell a random developer. Nor does a developer want to know about the specifics of which pages on Pornhub I'm actually looking at. This doesn't work. Um, some something that can help a lot with that, and um, and that's actually that, and, it's, and it's actually being used for that is Delta debugging. Because you have Delta debugging, which actually takes an entire page, say such as a web page with everything, and automatically reduces it to the minimum that is required, and then um, even a web page like Pornhub uh, is going to be reduced to an absolute minimum, which has nothing to do with porn anymore, and then there will be just those elements left in there, the JavaScript elements or whatsoever that actually cause the bug, and this is for from from my perspective far less sensitive to send around, and at the same time it generalizes the bug, and it also um, and it also makes it far easier to determine duplicates because if you have a minimal bug report uh, minimized input. Uh, then you can actually then um, it makes it easier to find out whether those features that are contained in this bug report actually are also contained in other bug reports. This is actually where delta debugging is being used in practice to find out where uh, duplicates are in order to find out which parts of an input are actually relevant. But yes, um, but but this is actually but but you know this is all well when i'm reporting a bug i'm going through all these steps because i have an idea of the developer who's sitting on the other side of the fence but for layman none of this works in any way <laughs> laymen are going to tell you that they have this that they have this uh, space gray laptop with a blue desktop background on which they have uh, on, on which they have they are running uh 
on which they are, among others, uh, running some WhatsApp thingy, but which has nothing to do with the error, I guess, or all sorts of details. And it goes down and trickles down and trickles down. And the one information that you actually want is, is not contained in there. But, the, but laymen do not have, an, do not have uh, a, a sense for which parts of their environment may be relevant for uh, producing a bug. And actually, who knows, maybe the, maybe the desktop color matters. Maybe your program crashes only on a blue desktop, on a blue screen, that is. Ha. Possible, possible. I mean, apparently, Zoom screen, as we have seen today, Zoom screen sharing doesn't work under certain circumstances. Care to find out why? Who knows? Is, do I have enough information to send a bug report? No. Should I send a bug report to Zoom that uh, sharing screen sometimes doesn't work? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's like your program crashes. Okay, I think that we already have extended our time a bit for today, or at least we are close to the maximum of 90 minutes. Any further questions? Konstantin, Johannes, something from the audience? No, still no questions from the audience. Okay, what do we have here? See, we have a link here. Windows Windows 10 bug crashes your PC when you access this location. Why on earth should I click on exactly this bug? Oh, I'm not running Windows 10. Oh, good. Good thing. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep that for I'm going to keep that for the attendees to, to click on and to see whether things work. Okay, folks, um, that's it for today. A bit of a bit of um, introduction into the wonderful world of using and mining bug and version databases. As I said, there's a there's a whole flurry of research around all this because simply there is so much data that is available and there's there can be quite some fun in data mining and it has real world consequences. So there's plenty of fun in there too. Uh, if you want to enjoy, if you want to toy with the visualization means that are included in the book and uh, go and find out what your own project looks like. Thank you very much for your attention and see all of you next week. Bye bye.